My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in Jerusalem in an area northeast of the Temple Mount where the fortress of Antonia was built, which eventually became the palace of Pontius Pilate. And Jesus was brought to this place to be judged and executed. But Pilate did not want to charge him with a crime. In fact, after interrogating him, the Bible says, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. This man has committed no crime. But in the midst of the conversation, Pilate discovered that Jesus was from Galilee. And when Pilate heard that, he said, wow, this is great. If he's from Galilee, then I don't have to deal with this. That's Herod's district. Let me send him to Herod. And Herod at that moment was in Jerusalem, just on the other side of town in his big palace. So Pilate said, send Jesus over there. So Jesus went to Herod. And Herod treated Jesus terribly. He and his bodyguards laughed at him, beat him, mocked him. And when they were finished with him, they said, we don't want to deal with him either. And they sent him back across town to this fortress, back to Pilate. Pilate ended up with a problem again. But after once again interrogating Jesus, this is what Pilate said. Luke chapter 23, verse 20, Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again to the people. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Verse 22, And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I found no cause of death in this man. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Verse 23, and they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed, and Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. He was charged, though not guilty. Amazing. It seems that Jesus' future was fixed. It simply could not be changed. And that's because it was the will of the Father for Jesus to die on Calvary as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the human race. For you, for me, for our friends, for our relatives, Jesus died for us and for all of them. Jesus could not avoid his future because this was the will of the Father for him. Thank God he embraced it because Jesus was willing to go to the cross today. You and I know him, and we're forgiven. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Easter story. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I hope you're having a good time in this series. I'm really enjoying digging deep into the Gospels to see what happened to Jesus when he was tried before his crucifixion. And today we're going to begin back at Herod's palace. Then we're going to go back over to Pilate's palace and see what happened to Jesus when he was shipped back to Pilate. But if you have a prayer request, would you please let us know? We'd love to pray for you. Many people don't know who to turn to for prayer. That's very critical. You need somebody to pray with you. And if you don't know who can pray with you confidentially, call us, contact us. We're here for you. We believe in prayer. We are people of prayer, and we would really love to stand in faith with you for whatever you're facing in your life. And by the way, when you contact us, please let me know what you think of these programs and what you're learning. It would mean a lot to me to hear from you. But I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to be honest, the reason I call them unknown facts is because they were unknown to me. I grew up in church every year hearing the same message at the time of Easter, and it was a great message. I was very grateful to hear it. But as I got older, I thought, is there not more to the story than what I've heard? So I began digging through the Gospels, and wow, what I found just amazed me. It caused this story to come alive in so many new ways. Now, everything I found is in this 25-part series, which is these programs with a marvelous study guide, really an amazing study guide. It comes with all the Greek words and the definitions, the points, the principles, and very important questions for you to reflect on. It would be great for your personal use to grow, or if you're discipling somebody, and I hope that you are discipling somebody, 
you need to be investing in someone else and this would be a great way for you to do that. Or if you're in a Bible study group, this would just be ideal for a Bible study group. Order yours today. We're also offering you my book that I highly recommend, not just because I wrote it, but because of what's in the pages of this book. It's amazing. Called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. This book is filled with treasures from the Gospels about all the events at the time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It will take you somewhere new in your faith. I'm absolutely sure of that. But today we're going to pick up where we left off in the last program in Herod's palace where Jesus is standing before Herod Antipas. And we're going to begin in Luke chapter 23, verse 11. And Luke chapter 23, verse 11, the Bible says, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught. We saw that these words, his men of war, the Greek word stratioma, really described Herod's personal bodyguards. Now remember, Herod was a king. He was educated. He should have known how to be very sophisticated in his behavior. And his bodyguards were sophisticated. They were intelligent. They were educated. They were very armed. But in this particular moment, these sophisticated, educated people began to act like animals. The Bible says they tried to set Jesus at naught. The Greek word exotheneo, the word exotheneo, set at naught, normally means to demolish something, the same word you would use to demolish a building, to demolish a building, to tear it down, to completely destroy it, to render it so destroyed it can never be rebuilt again. That is the word that is used here when the Bible says they set Jesus at naught. They tried to verbally demolish Jesus. I don't know if you've ever suffered the brunt of other people's verbal abuse and you felt like somebody was just trying to squash you verbally, that's what they were trying to do to Jesus. The word exotheneo really means to make one out to be nothing. If we had been there that night, we would have heard Herod and his men of war saying to Jesus, you are nothing to us, trying to diminish him. It means to make light of, to belittle, to disdain, to disregard, to despise, or to treat with maliciousness, and contempt. Remember that that night Jesus had already endured horrible verbal abuse from the soldiers who held Jesus before he went to Pilate. He had endured horrible verbal abuse at the hands of soldiers and religious leaders who screamed and yelled at him. And now he is in Herod's palace where it's happening again. It's like the demons of hell vented when Jesus was finally standing there yelling, screaming, trying to reduce Jesus verbally to nothing, demolish him. That's what it means when the Bible says they set him at naught. And that's not all. The Bible says that Herod, a king who knew how to behave better with his bodyguards who were sophisticated and educated and well-trained, these were men who knew how to be cultured, but instead they mocked him. Then the Greek word impaizo, and this word impaizo we've seen means to play a game, Often it was used for playing a game with children or amusing a crowd by impersonating somebody in a silly and exaggerated way. This word might be used in a game of charades when someone intends to comically portray someone or even to make fun of, to ridicule, to mock someone or to impersonate someone in a silly and exaggerated way. They literally disintegrated into animal behavior. And I'm going to read to you directly from my notes. Herod Antipas, an educated, cultured, and refined man with his bodyguards, were supposed to be professional in their conduct. And all of a sudden, they descended into depravity as they put on quite a show impersonating Jesus and the people he had ministered to. They hammed it up, acting as if they were healing the sick. They laid on the floor, quivering as if they were being liberated from devils. They groped around as if they were blind and then pretended to suddenly be able to see it was a game of charades to mimic and to make fun of Jesus. It was horrible behavior all directed at the Son of God. Wow. And Luke 23, 11 tells us in review, and Herod and his men of war set him at naught and mocked him. What did they do next? And they arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. When the Bible says they arrayed, the Greek word parabolo, 
The word parabolo means to throw around or to drape around as to drape a garment around one's shoulders. This phrase, gorgeous robe, is from a Greek phrase which describes a garment made of sumptuous, brightly colored, resplendent materials, likely a garment worn by a king or by a politician. And then once they had wrapped him in this gorgeous robe, they sent him again to Pilate. They got rid of him. They said, we're done with him. They could find no legal charge against him, but they were very displeased because Jesus did not perform a miracle on demand. Jesus did not meet their expectations. And when Jesus did not meet their expectations, that's when they begin to vent all their venom and all their anger against Jesus. But when they were done, they sent him back to Pilate, and Pilate was landed with the problem again. Oh, Pilate. Wow, this man was in such a fix. He thought he had finally found a loophole to get out of dealing with Jesus, and now Jesus is back in front of him again. But now when Jesus reappears, Jesus reappears dressed in a very sumptuous garment, a garment either worn by a king or by a politician. When Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate, he sent him clothed in this regal robe. It was his way of declaring, this is no king. This is just another pretender, another person running for some kind of office. It was another way of mocking Jesus as he sent Jesus back to Pontius Pilate. And when Jesus was returned to Pilate's court, Pilate reassembled all the religious leaders. So now all the religious leaders are gathered there in the Tower of Antonia, which had become Herod, Parrot's, Pilate's palace in Jerusalem. And in Luke 23, verses 14 to 16, Pilate says to the religious leaders, now listen to these words, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him, no, nor yet Herod. So Pilate says, I can't find anything wrong legally that this man has done. I sent him to Herod. Herod talked to him. Herod interrogated him. Herod can't find anything wrong either. For I sent him unto you, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But the Bible says that Herod, Pilate examined him, examined him. That word examined, the Greek word anacrino, the word anacrino means to examine closely, to scrutinize, or to judge judicially. Listen careful. Pilate was the chief legal authority of the land. There was no higher legal authority than Pilate. He knew Roman law, and his job was to see that Roman law was kept. From a judicial standpoint, he could not find a single crime Jesus had committed worthy of death. He could not find one crime. From purely a legal standpoint, Jesus was not guilty of anything. To add weight to the action, Pilate backed his view by saying, Herod has arrived at the same conclusion as I have. This man has committed no legal offense. This is the highest legal authority in the land speaking who says this man is not guilty of any of the charges that you've leveled against him. I find no fault. That word fault means no actionable cause against this man. Yet they were demanding for his death. And Pilate says, why? Why do you want him to be dead? Why do you want to kill him? This man has not done anything wrong. And by the way, this is also Herod's opinion. But the religious leaders were bent on shedding Jesus' blood. So Pilate, in an attempt to satisfy them, basically said, if you want to see blood, if that's what you want to see, let me chastise him. Well, that's the word fergello, which means to flog, to scourge. That is horrific. We're going to see what a scourge was like in the next program. They were asking for blood. So Pilate said, I don't want to kill this man. If you want to see blood, let me chastise him. Let me forget. Let me scourge the man. I'll give you blood, but I don't want to kill the man. 
but it was a custom at that time of the year for one prisoner to be released from prison as a favor to the people. Every year when it came time for this big event, all of Jerusalem waited with anticipation to see which prisoner would be released. And the religious leaders responded to Pilate when Pilate said, I'll chastise him and let him go. Listen to what the religious leaders began to scream in Luke chapter 23, verses 18 and 19. They screamed away with this man, that's away with Jesus, and release unto us Barabbas, who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Well, who was Barabbas? Who was this Barabbas? They said, release unto us, take Jesus, kill Jesus, crucify Jesus. At this time of the year, you owe us a favor. You always release one prisoner. Don't release this Jesus away with him and give us Barabbas in his place. Who was Barabbas? Well, the verse tells us quite a bit about Barabbas. The Bible tells us he was guilty of sedition, which means he was a rabble rouser who was proven guilty of sedition in the city of Jerusalem. What does sedition mean? The word sedition, the Greek word stasis, which means treason. It is the deliberate attempt to overthrow the government or to kill the head of state. Probably he had tried to kill Pontius Pilate. He had tried to assassinate somebody who was the head of the government locally. That would have been Pontius Pilate. And by the way, treason is what they were accusing Jesus of. Jesus, they said, was claiming to be the king of the Jews. That's how they were trying to bring Jesus down. They say, away with Jesus, but give us the one who really committed treason. Give us Barabbas. Wow, it's amazing. And the Bible says he was also guilty of murder. The word murder in this case is the word phronos. Listen to what it means. The word phronos means premeditated murder, intentionally killing, a calculated slaughter, a planned massacre. This was a terrorist. This was a terrorist. That's who Barabbas is. Barabbas had tried to overthrow the government, or he had tried to kill the head of state, the local ruler, maybe even Pontius Pilate. Barabbas had been guilty of premeditated murder, intentional killing, a calculated slaughter, a planned massacre. This was a bad man. In fact, he was so bad that the Bible tells us they had thrown him into prison. The verse actually says, and was cast into prison. That word cast is in the Greek word bala, which means to throw or to hurl. They couldn't throw this man into prison fast enough. That is how dangerous, how treacherous Barabbas was. This was a real local terrorist. And when the Bible says they threw him into prison, the Greek word phulake, which describes a Roman prison, a place of confinement or containment, there was nothing worse on the planet than a Roman prison. And now Barabbas was so dangerous, he had been hurled there. They threw him in when they got their hands on him as fast as they could because this was such a dangerous individual. He had tried to kill the head of state. He had planned a massacre. This man was dangerous in every way. He was guilty of treason of the highest order. And that's who they wanted to release. They said, if you're going to release somebody, don't release this Jesus. Away with this Jesus, but give us Barabbas. Well, the local people probably liked Barabbas because he had tried to overthrow the Roman government. They didn't like Romans. So they'd give us Barabbas. He's a local hero. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 23, verses 20 and 21, Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus. Wow. That word willing means earnestly willing, longing. He really wanted to release Jesus. Spoke to them again. But they cried saying, crucify him. Crucify him. It would be better translated, Pilate therefore wishing, longing, and earnestly desiring to release Jesus. But they cried out. The Greek word epiphaneo. The word epi means upon. The word phaneo means a voice, a loud voice. You can pound the two words together. Epiphania means to scream, to shout, to yell, to shriek, even to screech. And the Greek tense means they were hysterically screaming and screeching at the top of their voices, totally out of control. And the Greek means without pause. This was non-top 
stop screaming and screeching. Away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And Luke also tells us they were saying, the word saying, the Greek word legantes, the tense used here means they were endlessly pleading, demanding, and imploring. It was nonstop. And finally, in Luke 23, verses 22 and 23, Pilate said, why? What evil has this man done? Jesus simply was not guilty. I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. When the Bible says they were instant with their loud voices, they were instant is the Greek word epikamai. The word epi means upon, the word kami means to pile. You put the two words together, it means to pile on top of. They literally began piling on top of Pilate, burying him with their voices, suffocating him with their charges and their demands. And finally, to get what they wanted, John 19, 12 adds that they screamed out at Pilate, and they said, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaks against Caesar. And of course, that was the claim they brought against Jesus, is that Jesus claimed to be a rival king to the emperor. And they said, if you let him go, you are not Caesar's friend. Well, if Pilate lets him go, hmm, he himself is going to be punished. Because news will reach Rome that he let a rival king go. Rome will view this as treason. And Pilate himself will either be banished or executed for not being faithful to the emperor. Well, Pilate did not want to execute Jesus until he understood it was going to jeopardize his own job. Hmm. And Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 says, When Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. When he washed his hands, it symbolically meant again, I'm guilty. What I'm about to do is not punishable because I do not believe this man is guilty. And he washed his hands, and he turned Jesus over to the religious leaders, giving them exactly what they wanted, and then Jesus began to be chastised, he began to be scourged, and then eventually crucified, where he died on Golgotha for you and for me. We're out of time. Wow, this has just been packed. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $15. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now or go to renner.org. My name is Joe Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to tell you how your support is impacting thousands of people right here in Moscow. All around the world, people are living longer, and many elderly people in Moscow are left helpless and lonely. Loneliness is a terrible thing. No one should be left to die in loneliness. But because of your financial support, we're able to reach these wonderful people. Each week, we hold a concert for this great generation. After the concert, we invite these people to stay for a Bible study where they hear about Christ. 
Through these events, thousands of people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior in the sunset years of their lives. Now, not only are they finding community, overcoming their loneliness, but they're finding hope. They're finding Jesus. Would you consider joining us as a partner today? With your support, we're able to reach even more of these precious people. No one should die lonely. More importantly, no one should die without the opportunity to know Jesus. With your support, we're able to reach these people. Right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner and a part of the solution. Please call us or go online to winner.org. Your generous support makes a difference. Please call or go online right now. I want to add just a little bit more to the teaching from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24 where the Bible says, When Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. When the Bible says there was a tumult, that word tumult is a Greek word which describes an uproar, trouble that throws things into disorder, emotions that are out of control, a public outcry that is accompanied by shrieks and hysterical wailing, or a disturbance that results in panic and a breach of public order, a public disturbance. Romans did not like public outcries. They were against this and they did not permit it. And when Pilate saw things were getting out of control, he took action. In fact, the Bible says a tumult was made, was made, it's from the Greek word genomai, which describes something that takes you off guard or by surprise, or this whole situation evolved into something that Pilate simply did not anticipate. It completely got out of control, and things getting out of control is not something that Pilate permitted. And when this happened, he said, enough is enough. He took a vase of water. He washed his hands publicly. The Bible says before the multitude, before is a Greek word, which means publicly in the sight of everyone. And it was Pilate's way of saying, I am absolved of guilt. When he says I'm innocent, the Greek word actually means I'm guiltless of what is about to take place. And then he turned Jesus over to be scourged and eventually to be crucified. Jesus did all of this for you. And for me, it is just amazing. While we're out of time, when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see what happened next. We're going to see what it meant to be scourged. Thank you for being with me. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.